Welcome to the DryEye Phylon OSU F222 system. My Diamondback Explorer is sitting on planet AB1 in this system. It's the closest planet to the yellow dwarf star in this system. Let's open the galactic map to see where the system is located in the Milky Way galaxy. As we zoom out, you will see that we are near the galactic center, which explains the high concentration of stars and the yellow hue due to the dense gas. This system is in the Empyrean Strait Sector and just outside of the Galactic Center. We are about 26,500 light years from the Sol system. The reason why I decided to visit this system is that it has a stellar mass black hole which is in orbit around the yellow dwarf star. A stellar mass black hole is the result of a single massive star 10 to 100 times bigger than our star Sol collapsing down to an infinitely dense point that is anywhere from 20 to 65 kilometers across. We will depart the planet's surface now to go visit this black hole. The stellar mass black hole is straight ahead of us, below and to left of the star it orbits. The four equally spaced dots within the destination target circle is actually one single distant star. The immense gravity of the black hole distorts and bends light, so much so that it creates multiple images of the same object. The intense gravity can also magnify and bend the light of objects into elongated arcs. This effect is known as gravitational lensing. Frame shift drive charging. Some kind of gravitational lensing seems to be occurring here as well. Is this another black hole? Or is it something else? You will have the answer soon enough. As we will be investigating this object after we visit the stellar mass black hole. stellar mass black hole is currently only about 23 light seconds away. Due to its very small size, we will need to be very careful with our speed and approach it slowly. If we come in a little too fast, we will easily overshoot it. We are trying to hit a target that may only be a bit bigger than 20 kilometers across. Having left the planet's gravitational field, our speed is now increasing rapidly. As it does, the closing distance to the black hole is quickly diminishing. We need to keep the black hole dead center and slow down to sublight speed at just the right moment. As we get closer, you can see the bending of light around the black hole becoming more pronounced. It almost looks like a ball of stars is forming around it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to keep it dead center, and I came in too fast. If the speed is too high, the gravitational pull of any massive object will make it hard for the ship to slow down. Let's come about 180 degrees and try this again. I'm closer to it, and my speed is already lower, so we will have a better chance this time. I'm approaching the black hole very slowly and carefully this time. You will see just how quickly we come up on it. Due to the bending of light, a ball of stars quickly forms as we get closer. 
This is the gravitational lensing effect that is producing multiple images of the same stars. We are now so close that we have been forced to drop to sublight speed. The black hole's center is only about 29 kilometers away from us. I can get a little bit closer on thrusters, but I'm quickly forced to stop completely as I reach the body exclusion zone limit set in the game. As we maneuver around the black hole on thrusters, you'll notice the strange effects of the gravitational bending of light. The area around the black hole almost looks like a Christmas tree ornament. You will also see how close this black hole is to the star it orbits around. In the real world of space, a star this close to a black hole would have a stream of gas leading to the black hole. The black hole's gravity would continuously strip the star of its gas until there was only the dense core of a small white dwarf star left. It's the astronomical version of cannibalism. Remember that distortion we saw before visiting this black hole? As promised, we will now set a course to investigate it. From the navigation pane, we can see that there is a neutron star at that location. So that is where we will head to. Before we make the jump to Super Cruise, I will pass just to the right of the black hole. Have a look at the strange motion of the stars as we do. Stars appear to be moving in opposite directions of each other. This is again another effect of the extreme gravity of the black hole causing light to bend around it. Okay, let's jump to Super Cruise. Right after the four second countdown, watch the very rapid snapping effect as we exit the gravitational and light distortion zone of the black hole. Did you see it? Maybe not as it happens very fast. This is the smallest type of black hole, a stellar mass one. So the gravitational effects are very localized and close to the black hole. As we head towards the neutron star, you can see the black hole moving away behind us. We can only see it because of its gravitational field distorting the stars. Without that distortion, there would be no way to see that it is there. This is because light can't escape its gravity. This is why it's black. I've skipped ahead a bit to a point where we are able to start resolving what is located in this area. As we approach, there appears to be two separate elongated objects. But is this really two objects? Or is it one single one where the presence of a black hole is causing it to be duplicated? As we slow down, we can now see that these are two objects with astrophysical jets coming from their north and south poles. There are only two types of phenomena in Elite Dangerous that produce astrophysical jets. These are stellar remnants called white dwarfs and neutron stars. As we had originally set a course for a neutron star to get to this location, we know that at least one of these objects is of that type.
As we get even closer, we are starting to see gravitational lensing effects from both of these objects. Only an object with very high mass and an intense gravitational field can cause this effect. White dwarf stars are dense but much too small and not nearly compact enough to cause this effect. They are also clearly visible and very bright, so they aren't black holes. We therefore can conclude that both of these objects are neutron stars. These two neutron stars are gravitationally bound and are orbiting around each other. They both, in turn, are orbiting around the yellow star and black hole, who themselves are orbiting around each other. This system features very complex and unique orbital dynamics. As we get closer to one of the neutron stars, we can start to see the wobble of the astrophysical jets. The wobble is caused by a combination of the high-speed rotation and slight off-axis tilt of the star. Compared to the average wobble of neutron stars, this one is very slight. It's barely noticeable. This is because this neutron star is spinning at very high speed, speeds much greater than average. This could be what is known as a millisecond pulsar a type of neutron star that completes one rotation in 1 to 10 milliseconds. This means they spin hundreds of times per second. It's only their immense gravity that keeps them from flying apart. As we get closer to this neutron star, the high-speed spin of the star and the astrophysical jet is becoming more obvious. I will get as close as I can to this object. As I do, I'm forced to drop to sublight speed. Like the black hole we saw previously, I can get a bit closer using thrusters, but at this point, I'm only about 800 kilometers away from an object that is on average 10 to 15 kilometers across. Let's have a look now at the other neutron star in this pair. It too is spinning at very high speed, so it's likely another millisecond pulsar. Neutron stars obtain their high spin rates due to a process called conservation of momentum. Basically, as they shrink from a massive star, their original orbital spin rate holds constant. So as they get smaller in size, the star has to spin faster and faster to keep the same rate of spin it had when it was millions of times larger. Four, three, two, one, engage. Warning, temperature critical. We've jumped to super cruise now so we can get closer to the second neutron star. There is a tremendous amount of heat being generated in this environment due to combination of the two neutron stars. It's not a place you'd want to be without a well-shielded spacecraft. Even so, the heat sinks of my Diamondback Explorer are being pushed to their limits. For millisecond pulsars, the law of conservation of momentum mentioned earlier is not sufficient to get them spinning up to the rates they achieve. Another source is needed, such as the accretion of material from a nearby star. The high gravity of the neutron star will pull gas and material off the closely orbiting star. This process adds more and more material to the neutron star. The more material it accumulates, the faster it spins. We don't have a closely orbiting star here. However, it is very likely that the proximity of the two neutron stars to each other has resulted in them becoming millisecond pulsars. Their mutually strong gravitational fields have caused them to spin each other up to these high speeds as they orbit around each other. We are now going to perform a risky maneuver and fly directly through one of the astrophysical jets of the neutron star. It's risky because the material is very hot contains a very high electrical charge, and is moving at a fraction of the speed of light. Despite the risk, the astrophysical jet can be used to charge the ship's frameshift drive or FSD if you stay in it long enough. 
This reduces the hydrogen fuel needed to charge the FSD for a hyperspace jump. However, it remains a risky option as repeated flights through astrophysical jets can damage the FSD to the A point of being unreliable or non-functional. Flying through them also causes a near complete loss of control of the ship. You are seeing this loss of control as we fly through it. The astrophysical jets of a neutron star are caused by the intense magnetic field generated by the high density of the matter in them. The matter is mostly neutrons, which form when protons and electrons are forced to combine under extreme pressure. Due to the neutron star's spin and magnetic field, high-speed streams of matter are ejected into space at the north and south poles of the star. Here we are getting a very nice view of this pair of neutron stars. Neutron stars orbiting this closely together are going to pull each other closer and closer together with each orbit. Eventually they will collide and merge, resulting in one of the most powerful events in the universe which is called a kilonova. The event is so violent and energetic that it creates ripples through the very fabric of space and time. The combined object is usually a black hole, but it could also be a type of neutron star called a magnetar. Magnetars are the most magnetically powerful objects in the universe. Their magnetic fields are 1,000 times stronger than a typical neutron star and a quadrillion times stronger than Earth's magnetic field. I have opened up the galactic map through the navigation pane so we can plot a course back to the Sol system. Due to the distance we need to travel, it takes much longer than usual for the game to calculate and plot the course. It will take 758 jumps with my Diamondback Explorer to arrive back in the Sol system. At an average of 35 light years distance per jump, that gives a total distance to travel of about 26,530 light years. It takes an average of about two minutes from the time a jump is completed to when the FSD has cooled down to then begin charging and then jumping to the next waypoint. This works out to 1,116 total minutes or about 25.5 hours of game time. Before making the jump out of this system and start our long journey back to Sol, we will do a last fly past of the pair of neutron stars. We'll also once again fly through the astrophysical jet of one of them. Let's see if we can stay in the astrophysical jet long enough to charge the frameshift drive. Warning! Frameshift drive operating beyond safety limits. safety limits. Unfortunately, the neutron star is spinning too fast, and the wobble of its jet is too chaotic to keep the ship in it long enough to charge up the FSD. So we'll just line up with the jump target circle and charge the drive the Friendship usual way. Drive charging. Enjoyed this video. See you back in Seoul in about 26 hours of game time.